Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another exciting edition of God's Way Back. My name is Dr. Bruce Shelton. I am a homeopathic medical doctor, family physician, and I'm here with a good friend of mine who I've known for many years. He was actually a teacher of mine when I was a student, Dr. Kent Pomeroy. Thank Kent, you. Kent, nice welcome to, to the show. Thank you. Dr. Pomeroy is currently the president of the Arizona Homeopathic and Integrative Medical Association. He is licensed as a medical doctor and as a homeopathic medical doctor. And he has a subspecialty that's actually made him quite famous in that he is probably one of the foremost physicians in the United States that does a procedure known as prolotherapy. And we're going to learn today where he got his background from and, uh, and then talk about prolotherapy and figure out what to do and what someone should look for when they're trying to choose a prolotherapist. Of course, the answer is you go see Dr. Pomeroy. Uh, before we start, however, I'd like to point out that you should all go out and get the issue of Phoenix Magazine that just came out this last week. And that's because this is their doctor issue where uh, the doctors of the Valley kind of vote to see who they like. Uh, well, it, there's a special section in here where we got the opportunity actually to insert a little thing about yours truly. And it's the first time they've ever had a homeopathic family medicine in, in the book, and I'm, I'm quite proud of it to be representing the homeopathic community. I actually asked them if they wouldn't mind next year voting among the homeopaths, that this, this was a kind of a personal thing. But uh, the, the homeopaths should have a right. They let the pediatricians vote. They let the medical doctors vote. They let the internists vote, et cetera. They didn't vote for prolotherapists. We voted for a few anyway. I know. I know that. I know that. And I appreciate it. It's a lot of fun to be in a magazine. I've gotten a lot of phone calls, and it's, it's been exciting. Um, when I was a family practice resident at Good Samaritan Hospital in 1971, I had a rotation called Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, and you were in charge of that department. Uh, do you remember those days? Oh, yes. Uh, perhaps you could give us a little bit of your background and, uh, and tell us your background in medical training and how you ended up being, because you were like in charge of that department for the longest time. Well, Good Samaritan Hospital here in Phoenix. Well, I was a residency training director for the Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation Department at the Institute of Rehabilitation, Med Rehabilitation Medicine at Good Samaritan Hospital. I was the assistant medical director also, and I worked there for about six years on staff at the hospital and full-time staff before I went out into private practice. My, Where did you go to medical school? I went to the University of Utah College of Medicine, got my MD degree there. And then, and then, then you came to Phoenix? Or, or how did you get into PM&R? That's, a, that's, a, that's got to be a story. Well, I was interested in orthopedics and neurology, and I was interested in uh, physical side of medicine, you know, the physics of medicine. And as I did my internship at Good Samaritan Hospital, um, I met a Dr. Carl Bjorklund, and Dr. Bjorklund was the new director of the Institute of Rehabilitation Medicine there at Good Samaritan Hospital. And he explained to us interns just what the specialty was all about. And I, I listened to him, and I realized that uh, this was something that would put my orthopedic interest, my neuro neurology interest, my physics of medicine interest, my anatomy interest all together in one package, and I, I would uh, be able to live a pretty decent life and not have to take the, the nightlife and the... Night call. Night call, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. The night call where you have to live during the night when you're working as an orthopedic surgeon. Those poor guys really went through a lot of hard, long hours in their residency training. And uh, I was not looking forward to that side of my training. So physical medicine rehabilitation just filled, filled the bill of what I was looking for. So I went off into the Army for two years, came back to Good Samaritan Hospital and helped them get their residency program started. So I was their first residency first resident in their residency program at Good Samaritan Hospital. Stayed there for a little over three years in my uh, training and then uh, went off to Tucson to start the rehabilitation program at St. Mary's Hospital. Uh, came back to Good Samaritan Hospital a year later 
and became a full-time staff member in, in the department. Um, I was always trying to find a better way to solve pain problems, the musculoskeletal pain problems. Um, I didn't like to use a lot of drugs. I knew there ought to be a better way to solve pain problems, and I was always searching, looking for a better way. Um, I used a lot of the techniques that we had available and tried to improve on them to help the patients uh, with with these terrible back and hip and muscle pains and uh, it was just natural for me to fall into what I'm doing now as time went along. All right, well, let's uh, let's 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 go back and, and take it apart piece by piece. I mean, basically yours is a specialty that deals with people with chronic pain and but you also deal with other things too like people well, with chronic, strokes and well, yeah. things like that. In rehabilitation uh, specialty, you treat spinal cord injury patients and stroke patients, arthritis patients. Well, that leads into a question I had. I remember, you know, I was a family practice resident from 1971 through 1974, and as you start in the in the second two years, in the second in the second and third of the years, you start going through these rotations, and I think we were there for like two months mm -hmm. on 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 that rotation, and I remember hearing that I remember Governor George Wallace got shot. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember that you were involved somehow in training the nurses that they flew out from Alabama that had to take care of them. How did that story go? I don't think I was part of that story, Dr. I, I heard a rumor that you trained the nurses. I mean, that was the story that went around the hospital, that, that, well, that, the, I, that the nurses didn't know what they were doing, and they needed no. some specialized care, and they came out to watch your service to see, see how you did it, so they went back and took care of them. No? You know, I was not on the spinal injury part of uh, okay. the rehab department at that point. I was in the general rehab and I took care of the stroke patients and all of the uh, new patients who had pain problems. Uh, we had a spinal injury section of three or four doctors then. Uh, and we had specialized spinal injury nurses on the rehabilitation floor. But I, I wasn't part of the rehab team in the spinal injury. So they really didn't say, okay, well, that, squash well, that rumor. Anyway. Yeah. Well, I heard you, that's how I heard, I heard he was famous, that they came all the way out to learn from you. Well, I always remember that specialty as the patients that are kind of left behind, you know, like I imagine there's injuries going on in the in the war mm -hmm. situations right now, and, then, and, and those kind of patients that are always hurting, that never get better, I mean, those are the ones that that the average doctor doesn't know what to do with, and, and doesn't know how to deal with them. So, so but you ended up getting interested. I mean, did, have you had successes in getting people out of these bad situations? I mean, obviously you must have to stay with. Yes, it. I've been successful in helping a lot of patients who've had pain for over 30 years. I I look at these types of patients and I say these are the ones that fall through the cracks. Right. You know, conventional medicine helps a lot of problems. It helps a lot of pain problems, helps a lot of rehabilitation problems, surgical problems, medication problems. Help a lot of these people, physical therapy, occupational therapy. But there are a certain number of these people who fall between the cracks. The conventional medicine does not know how to evaluate or treat. And that's the niche that I put myself into. And besides helping the people who are falling between the cracks, I found that what I do helps a lot of the people who are ordinarily planning to go to surgery or have a lot of physical therapy or a lot of medications and help those folks stay away from the surgery, reduce the amount of physical therapy they have, or reduce I have seen you do wonderful things. We're, we're going to be talking about that. So here you are, good Sam, and you were there for like six years, and then, and then you left to go into private practice. Right. Now, you must have been at that time developing other interests because I don't remember learning. I mean, what you do is is very careful injecting, which you're going to explain in a little bit. But I don't remember that going on in the hospital. I mean, you evidently developed those interests after you got into private practice. What is the the development of well, how you got into this? What led me into this was that the hospital administrator, uh, Stephen Morris, and uh, my boss, was Carl Bjorkman, said, can't we want you to be the hospital acupuncturist? Because you're the one who's handling all these difficult pain patients, and we want acupuncture to be used in the hospital setting. 
This is back in the that was 70s. They wanted Acupuncture in 1974. Really? That's just after Nixon got right. Here. Nixon is the one who made it famous by right. what's his name, uh, James Reston of the New York Times, having his appendix out mm -hmm. with acupuncture. So what happened? So I went off the train of acupuncture and came back, and I practiced acupuncture in the hospital for two years, uh, and was fairly successful. Uh, I went into private practice then in July 1976 and took this acupuncture uh, program with me. Where did you go learn acupuncture? New York Society of Acupuncture for Physicians and Dentists. It was in New York City. Well, I don't remember, you know, I, I hate to say this, but I mean, for the longest time, alternative type procedures like acupuncture weren't accepted. And now I'm learning from you that back in the 1970s, you were actually doing it at Good Samaritan Hospital here here in Phoenix. I mean, how did right. how was that allowed to go forward? Because our boss told me to do it, so I said, I'll do it. That was Stephen Morris, the hospital administrator. After you left, did anyone follow and keep doing it? No. No. It's nobody. not done there. Is it, I don't even think it's done there today, is it? No, not that I'm aware of. So for two years, there was a bright light in the world, <laughs> and, and, and there you were. So so what happened when you went into private practice? This is interest, This is history of Arizona medicine. <laughs> this is interesting now. Go ahead. I moved across the street and took all my stuff in a wheelchair, pushed it across the street, and moved into a private office. And uh, How come I, you did that? They didn't want you to stay there? Or? I wanted to go into private practice. And I was working 12 hours a day and, and didn't take breaks. And I was just working real hard and working for a salary. And I was also the middle management assistant medical uh, director and I had to decide on you know make this middle management decisions which meant that I was working all the time and I had to do the catch-up things that other people couldn't do and I said gee if I have to work this hard for salary I might as well be working this hard for myself and so I left the pressures of middle management and went out and sold a private practice and I've been sold a private practice ever since when I got into my little private office, I did a lot of acupuncture and I kept seeing a lot of pain patients. I found that acupuncture had its, had its place, but it did not keep people pain-free all of the time. I could treat a patient, they'd eventually get to be pain-free for about a week, but they had to have their treatment every week in order to maintain their, their relative freedom of pain and they were angry at me if I went off to a medical seminar or had a vacation because I wasn't there to give them their week, weekly, uh, weekly acupuncture. So I said, you know, my job is to get people so they don't need doctors anymore. So they can, we aren't married to their doctor. Hmm. They need to be independent. See, that's the real rehabilitation goal. Physical medicine rehabilitation is to make people independent so they can be as effective, functional as they possibly can, reach the maximum maximum of what their potential is. Right, okay. And, and acupuncture didn't allow them to do that. It, it made them depend on me all of the time. Well, you know, it's interesting that you should say this, but the very next show we're going to do in a couple weeks is going to have a Dr. Mickey Shima on it who's coming here he, he actually works for HEAL. There's a big convention here in town. And he's one of the leading acupuncture people in, in the world. And, and he's like a licensed acupuncturist, which has become a specialty. Even in Arizona, we now have an acupuncture board. And I was actually looking forward to asking him all these questions about acupuncture, which I didn't know that you were involved in. And I'm going to actually ask you, could you explain briefly or as basically as you can, what exactly is acupuncture? Well, acupuncture is a stimulation of nerve endings that cause blood vessels to dilate, causes the gate theory of pain, it shuts the gate down in the spinal cord that is carrying information through the nervous system to the spinal cord to the brain so the patient is aware that they have pain. And the gate is opened or closed by various things, the anxiety, stress, uh, fear, those all open the gate, uh, but medications, relaxation, uh, neurological stimulation of various kinds kind of shut the gate. They slowly close the gate, or they quickly close the gate. So it's part of the gate theory of pain. 
and it also stimulates endorphins in the brain. Our endorphins are the brain's natural morphine, and there are brain centers where these endorphins attach, and when they plug in like a light socket or plug plug going into a wall outlet, it turns the pain off, and so that's what endorphins do. But what is this gate opening and close? What what well, is trying to get through the gate that doesn't get through? Well, Melzack and Wall developed this gate theory of pain, and it just to simplify it, there are things that cause the gate to open and allow the pain information to get to the brain, and other things that cause the gate to shut, so the information only goes so far, and the brain is not aware that there's pain going on. All right, but you are talking about nerves that sense pain. Now, we all know that there are nerves in the body. There's the central nervous system. There's the autonomic nervous system. But I've always believed that the acupuncturists think that there's another system, these meridians that they talk about where there's spots on them where you stick the needles. I mean, how does that get involved in this? Well, that's, those are the energy flow circuits. And we believe that uh, the energy flow circuits, the meridians, all have little wall outlets to plug into or to do something with, and those little wall outlets are acupuncture points. And so you can put something into that little wall outlet or, or acupuncture point and turn something on or turn something off. And that's what the acupuncture needle does, but it's in the energy flow system. And so, well, what is the energy flow system? Thank you. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there are, are organ lines, uh, things that are connected to different organs. Well, how have people figured that out? I mean, you know. They did it 6,000 years before I was born. <laughs> okay, but, but, let, but let, let's get into something that I've always had curiosity on. I mean, I know that, that nerves start in the brain, go down the spinal cord. Then there's the autonomic nerves that go through the little soft tissue holes in the base of the skull. And, and you can map them, you can see them. And, uh, and if, if you get injured over here, it's gonna hurt because the pain signal is going up this tract mm -hmm. in your spinal cord. But these flow, these energy flow meridians, which are not related anatomically to anything that I'm aware of, although I've heard it hinted that it really is the sympathetic flow of the, of the autonomic nervous system. But how do you make the connection of sticking the needle into this meridian point and making pain go away on the nerve, which is somewhere else. I mean, I mean what's the well, connection? You have to look at the thing I said first, the gate theory of pain and the endorphins. Okay. And, and if you give yourself enough endorphins, you're going to shut the pain off in the brain level. If you do something at the spinal cord level, to close the gate, you're going to keep the pain from getting to the brain. The meridians are probably more closely related to the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system, which is not the same pathway as the nerve going to the skin and having sensation or going to the muscle and making it contract. That's a, that's a different... Right, okay. Nervous so, system. but you're sticking the needle into this meridian point and you know where they are, and somehow you've been taught where they are. And I don't, you know, I don't. But they have weird ways of finding them too. With, with where you measure your fingers, and and has weird Chinese names of where they are. Yeah. But when you stick the needle into these points, it does affect the other parts of the body. And and how do they connect? Are they connecting through the brain? Are they connecting through some kind of energy pathway, or or what's happening? Well, I believe the energy pathway has something to do with the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system. Blood vessels are innervated by the sympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic nervous system. The sweat glands are innervated by that nervous system. So that's not the same nervous system as the one that tells you if you burned your finger or the one that tells you to move your hand because you just burned your finger. That's a different nervous system. So I believe that acupuncture is probably working in more than one pathway at a time. Okay, all right, so let's go further. Now, you say that you learned how to do this acupuncture and you did it well and you made the patients pain free, but a week later their pain came back. Right. So, that, so your quest of knowledge wasn't over. So, what right. happened to you next? Well, the beauty of acupuncture was that it broke my paradigm. 
because I was a straight doctor at one time. I mean, there was the box and I was in that box. And when my boss said, you learn how to do acupuncture, I said, and I don't believe in it, but I'll do it if you tell me to, so I did it. I had been doing trigger point injections for several years. Wait a minute, what's that? Well, trigger point injection is you find a sore place in a muscle where they're having a lot of pain. You find the hot spot in that muscle, and that place really hurts when you put your finger on it. If you push hard enough, not only hurts there, but it makes it hurt someplace else. And that's, that's a trigger point. And so I was injecting those trigger points on my own, kind of taught myself where all these trigger points were in the body. What were you injecting them with? Just Novocaine. I said, okay. And the, when they were not sensitive anymore, all that pain in that area went away. So when I went to the acupuncture course, disbelieving in the whole thing to start with, I opened my acupuncture chart that they handed out at the beginning of the class, and I said, there's all my trigger points I discovered. Somebody found them 6,000 years before I did. I see. So that so you're saying that these trigger points would occur on these acupuncture meridians. A lot of them were, yes. So, okay, so you were sticking needles in them before, but now you're injecting them with Novocaine. What was the difference? Well, I was did the putting, pain did the pain go away forever when you did that, or no? But the pain came back when you injected with Novocaine too. Oh, okay. But now I could put the needle in and not give them any old Novocaine, and they didn't get sick from having too much Novocaine. So. They just had the needle. All right. So, but now, but I'm still waiting for the rest of the story. Well, right. I mean, you're injecting them with Novocaine now. They're still coming back in a week. So, so what's next? I went to the University of Chicago Medical School to a pain seminar. And I sat next to a fellow who was in his late 70s. His name was Gus Hemwall. He was from the Oak Park, Illinois area. And uh, Gus kept talking under his breath. He kept mumbling. Uh... They have a medicine for that, it doesn't work very well, but I can treat this with what I do. Well, finally I got Gus aside and I said, just what is it you're doing, you're talking about? He said, I'm giving him prolotherapy. Okay, what, what is, here comes a message from, uh, from the oh, booth. It's a question. Okay, here we got a question here. Could there be a spiritual pathway to the nerves? We'll get to that in a minute. Let, okay. Let's talk about the prolotherapy. The answer is yes, Andrew. Well, I'm an artist, so I drew a shoulder, and I drew an elbow, and I drew a back, and I said, all right, Dr. Hemwall, if a person has pain in this area, what are you looking for if you're going to give them prolotherapy? He said, you, he took his little red pen, and he said, you're looking for pain and tenderness in this area, and then you put the needle in here, and you put some prolotherapy solution in there, and that does something to stop the pain because it makes the tendons and the ligaments and the joints heal up so they don't have any pain anymore. Now wait a minute. You said prolotherapy solution. What, what is prolotherapy solution? It can be a lot of things, but the word prolotherapy was coined to mean proliferative therapy. And so you can use a concentrated sugar solution, a concentrated calcium, a concentrated saline solution. Uh, you can use a combination of other things that are put together to do this with. Cod liver oil derivative called sodium moruate. A lot of different things have been used. So what does that do? That causes a local inflammation which mimics the body's healing reaction and that healing reaction is inflammation. That inflammation causes the tissue to grow to repair itself just like a, a cut or a, a scrape, or a tear, or a sprain, those tissues are inflamed temporarily. They're told then to get to work, repair that thing that's been damaged by growing new tissue to, to patch up the damaged place. And that's what happens when your skin heals after a cut. And so if you put that solution on a tendon or on a ligament or on a joint that mimics the body's natural inflammatory response to an injury, you just tell the body, get to work, fix yourself right there. Now I have heard it, but let, let's talk about practical examples. I mean, I have seen you deal with back patients uh, that has these chronic sprains in their back and maybe even their discs are a little 
disrupted to some degree. They're not totally ruptured, but they're they're at a place. And you come along and you inject that area with this prolotherapy solution, and the ligaments kind of grow back and it strengthens the back, and then it doesn't hurt anymore. Why doesn't the body do that on its own? If the body is going to be provoked to do it, why doesn't it do it without you? There are a lot of reasons. First reason might be that the person has such a severe injury that the natural healing response, which only lasts about a month, isn't strong enough to completely patch up that sprain area. Now, the skin will continue to grow. The skin is always growing, and bones are always growing. But ligaments and tendons only grow for a short time after they've been stimulated by an injury. And then they shut down. They're not going to heal anymore. If the injury is too large for enough tissue to grow to patch it up completely, then you're left with a chronic sprain or a ligament or tendon weakness. Another reason is because most people run off to get aspirin or a leave or Advil or one of the anti-inflammatory agents, Vioxx and so forth. What does that do? Well, those are anti-inflammatory. And what is an injury? An injury is an inflammation. If you want the inflammation to be there so the injury will grow back together and heal itself, you're going to stop that healing process if you take aspirin or Advil or Aleve or any of the anti-inflammatory agents. So it's only going to partially grow back together. It's going to have a strong impairment of that healing response by the medicine you take. Then you have people who are malnourished, people who do not have adequate hormone stimulation, which helps the immune system and the healing system, uh, people who don't have enough vitamins, people who are the uh, nouveau vegetarians who don't know how to eat the right vegetables, fruits, to get enough protein to provide the building block for growing things back together. Uh, people who have diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, people who are injured when they have influenza, have a bad case of the flu. All of these are factors that retard the amount of healing that someone's going to have. So you end up with somebody with a problem that has inadequate repair when the, when the healing and repair shuts down. So what you're saying is if someone really was in a car accident, gets rear-ended, and really sprains their back, that their, their back is going to try and heal. Right. But then they're going to go take pain medicine because they're in pain, and the pain medicine is actually going to stop the healing. Not all pain medicine. Not all pain medicine. Only the anti-inflammatory. Only the anti So they're going to take an anti-inflammatory, and and or they're going to have arthritis and take a lot of anti-inflammatories, and then get left a month later where the body just doesn't want to patch the thing over, and you come over there and start doing it again and and fix people that are going to be sent for surgery. Let's say. Right. Well, cortisone shock will stop the healing, too. So some people have an injury and they'll go off and get a cortisone shot by their doctor. You know, that's going to stop the healing, too. Well, like, what are some things that actually you deal with most of the time that are the cause of pain? What kind of physical problems are helped best by this procedure? Any tendon, ligament, or joint that is arthritic or has been injured, either in a severe injury or multiple small injuries. You know, we can start with the TMJ, we can go to the cervical spine with chronic headaches, if somebody has arthritis of their neck, but they have residual of uh, a, a neck injury from an automobile accident or from a sports injury, shoulder problem with tendonitis, arthritis, uh, fractured rib is a good, good thing to get prolotherapy for because it can, when you inject that fracture site, it'll stop the pain the first time. If not the first time, we'll stop it the second time and help it to heal faster. Uh, your cartilages. What about knee? A, a knee cartilage? Well, I'm just going down the body. Oh, all right, yeah. go ahead. We go to the upper back, the low back, sacroiliac joints, the lumbar spine. It can help stabilize a spine that is loose, that has developed a herniated disc. If the spine is too unstable, the disc is in jeopardy and that's a lot of times what wears the disc out or allows it to herniate. So if you can inject the ligaments in the back part of the spine and toughen up that part of the spine, it will protect the disc, 
Sometimes it protects it well enough, allows the spine to be stable, and that herniation will dry up or disappear or not bother the patient anymore. So we talk about hip, tendonitis, arthritis, sprains, um, ACL and medial collateral ligament tears. And ACL is an anterior cruciate ligament of the knee. Medial collateral ligament. Like some of these basketball players get. Arthritis. Uh, if a tendon or a ligament is completely severed, so there is no bridging fiber left between the two ends, it's not going to jump that gap and grow, grow back together. But if you have any bridging at all, when you inject it, it adds more bridging and you, after several treatments, can get a really strong tendon or ligament back there. Okay, I, I, gotta, I gotta change the subject slightly on acceptance of this procedure by the medical community, by the insurance community. I mean, I, I think you've, you've got some stories you could tell us. I mean, I mean, here you are, I mean, the head of Good Samaritan Hospital, Steve Morris, he was a very powerful man, I mean, I remember him because when I was a resident there, he was like the god of Arizona medicine, right. sends you off to get you taught how to do acupuncture back in the mid 70s. And you go learn how to do it, and then you learn that there's these techniques you can use in addition, where you're using medical type things to inject into these same places, and you actually get results with these things. Um, and it's not just you, it appears to be almost nationwide. Why isn't this part of regular medicine to the point that they just embrace it the way I would think they would, because I know they don't. Well, it's philosophical and it's economical. Well, what's the problem? The, the, the philosophy is that medicine has always had two schools. You know, in ancient Europe, you had the bone setters and the barber surgeons. Yeah. In America, you had the nature paths and the MDs. I'm not the nature path, the homeopaths and the MDs. We'll get to that because you are a homeopath right yeah, now as well. Right. Okay, but go ahead. But the strongest medical organization, probably in the world, is American Medical Association. And American Medical Association is a good organization. They work hard for their doctors. They promote a lot of good things for the patients. But what you're not up on, you're down on. And this is one of the things that AMA is not up on. Take it one step farther, back to the medical schools. We have to ask, where do the medical schools get most of their funding? Do they get it from the taxpayers? I think they probably get most of their funding from drug, company. drug companies for the millions of dollars in research that are poured into the school to support the departments to do drug research for the drug companies. Now, what are the things that are, uh, the schools are teaching? The schools are teaching how to use drugs and how to do surgery. I mean, those are the big things of the medical school. And sure, there's pediatrics, obstetrics, and pathology, and radiology, and everything else. But the big things to treat patients is medicines or surgery. All right, so here's the question. Here's the question. I mean, you know, it's one thing where, with homeopathy, which we'll talk about in a minute, where you take very dilute amounts of things where there's hardly any molecules left, so you scratch your head and say, how could this be working? And of course, we know it's an energy type of thing. But then you take a thing like prolotherapy, where if you wanted to, you could actually, in the middle of these injections, cut a hole and look, and you would see that these things are growing back together. And, and it's something you can touch and feel and see and prove. Um, why wouldn't everyone who pulled their ligaments and their cartilages go to get these medicines injected and have everything heal up the way you're saying. Because they've been taught by the leaders of medicine that they should go to the other doctors who are doing the things they're taught in medical school to everybody. Now Let's some of the medical schools and some of the residency programs are teaching prolotherapy. They are teaching it. So it isn't totally out of the medical school world. But, but make the sense medical of it isn't. schools are supported by drug companies and they promote medicine and they promote surgery. Who and taught you how to do prolotherapy? Well, Gus Hemwall. But let me finish that uh, statement. Uh, I'm ahead of you. The, the economics of the situation is that if you have a prolotherapy treatment, you're not going to have to have any more physical therapy. And if you do, it's only a small amount. You're not going to have to keep taking drugs. And there's a good chance you won't have to have surgery. 
and that's not absolute. It's not 100%. Oh, I've seen it, it happen. It's absolute, and everyone I've it's, seen stay with it. It's 80 or 90%. Yeah, and that's, those are pretty good odds. If you go to the surgeon and ask him, what are your odds for good results with back surgery, they almost always tell you it's 50-50. But in prolotherapy, we're looking at odds that are 80% or better. And, but if everybody's promoting prolotherapy, we're not going to have surgeons and drug companies and those, those folks be making the economic having the economics the way they want. But what you're actually saying is that the, 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 the establishment would rather people stay sick and not get healed just so some business entity can make money out of it. No, I'm not really you're not going that far. No, I'm not going that far because doctors oh, yeah. for the most part want to help their patients but they want to help them the way they're trained to help them and the way it's set up to, to treat them is the way they've built their life around and they're not going to pull the rug out from under themselves and start telling all their patients to go and get prolotherapy because they wouldn't have a practice and they want to do what they're taught to do that they believe in and well, so they're going to do that well wait a minute i mean you learned how to do prolotherapy when 1977 1977 i seem to remember being on you know i'm president of the homeopathic board two president president association president of the board sitting here of the state state homeopathic community i remember when you got your homeopathic license was must have been 1997 right 97 well from 77 to 97 you were doing this under just your regular medical license right um how are you doing it? I'm still doing it under my regular medical license. Okay, I, I realize that. So, I mean, how is it happening? And why, and why aren't all the orthopods going to learn how to do this? Well, some of them are. Some oh. of them are, and some of them are referring patients to me. But most of my patients are referred by patients who have had good results, and the satisfied customers are sending their patients to me. Does it ever not work? Yeah, it doesn't work about 10% of the time. Is there a reason why it wouldn't work, or just non-compliance, or patient taking drugs, or, or? Well, it falls back into the category of when is enough treatment enough, and sometimes uh, a patient has to have six or eight treatments to get a good result. A really serious case may need 20 or 30 treatments, and the, and the patient's insurance companies may not be paying for it. Medicare doesn't pay for it. Most people are paying out of their own pocket and not getting any reimbursement. And so when is enough enough? Now if I do 12 treatments on a patient and they haven't seen any results yet, that's a lot of treatment. Well, they may need 25 or 30 treatments to get the results we're looking for. I'm not willing to push them out that far and find out way down the road that they still haven't seen any improvement. And so what I do is I'll treat them up to a certain point and say, now let's let all of this accumulate and do its job, and let's see in two or three months, see how it's come together. The beauty of it is that when I treat a patient to the point where we feel like we can discharge them because they've reached enough improvement, and then we do a six month and 12 month follow up because I'm doing a, a, a study, an outcome study, and I've been in that about six years now. The outcome is that the patients who are discharged have pretty good results or we wouldn't be able to discharge them. At six months, they're, re they're reporting even additional improvement. And at 12 months, they're even having greater improvement. So a lot of those people who have six or eight treatments but just aren't where we want them to be, rather than for economic reasons, we, we rather than have them continue when we don't know if this is going to be the right thing for them or not, we stop and let all of this accumulate. A lot of them will say in two or three months that they feel a whole lot better. We may not have to treat them anymore after that. Okay. And then a lot of these people we don't we lose contact with, so we don't know if if when we discharge them, they were only they 40 percent better. We can't track them down, and maybe they're a lot better a year later, but we don't know. All right. So now now let's take your life a little bit further in the progression. Uh, you're doing this for 20 years, 1997, you, or maybe 1996, you decide you're going to be a homeopath, and you start studying homeopathy. How did that, I mean, where does that fit into your picture? 
that's part of the problem. I'm trying to solve the problem of uh, putting pieces together to make the big picture for the patient. Okay. And so the patient's lifestyle, their nutrition, what they're doing for themselves in the way of supplements and diet and exercise, that has to be part of the getting well situation. And that that has a big effect on pain and certainly a big effect on prolotherapy. And so homeopathy then fits into that niche too because there are homeopathic remedies that will allow a problem to recover more rapidly, allow them to have their symptoms relieved more thoroughly. When you can do that, you're, you're improving the whole picture of the patient better than just by putting shots of concentrated sugar and Novocaine into somebody. Well, just out of curiosity, I'm, I'm interested. I mean, what is, are there any standard protocols of, of homeopathics or vitamins that you use along with this that, that, that are some pearls for anyone that might be listening? Well, as far as homeopathics go, there are lots of, there are so many remedies, and you can select several remedies for each problem. And so I don't have one single one that I use. I kind of custom design the treatment for that, that person. But as far as the supplements go, uh, the patients need to be on a healthy diet. Um, they need to be getting some protein. They need to have vitamin C and MSM, glucosamine sulfate and zinc. And so they need the adequate vitamins and minerals with those supplements. But did you hear at Dr. Alta Smith a couple of weeks ago? No, when I didn't. She was, Dr. Smith, who works who works for Heal as a speaker, just came up with some really interesting evidence on the use of Traumil, which everyone always thought the 14 ingredients were there haphazardly and the body selected what it wanted. I actually have evidence that have come out now that this remedy, uh, this ingredient makes that ingredient makes that ingredient, makes that ingredient, and it's all synergistic in the remedy. And she gave this amazing lecture where the use of traumeal and zeal as an, as an anti-arthritic, but then these wonderful concepts of using something like spascupril, which stops muscle spasm, which stops pain, and then this remedy called thalamus, which works on the brain, which resets the pain center and then coenzyme compositum for, for catalyst for stimulating aerobic metabolism. But something like that is something that's ideal in a pain syndrome, right. while in fact you're injecting with the prolotherapy to make it all come back, that it's, it's amazing that here we sit as part of this smaller profession in Arizona. You realize I trained at Good Sam as a medical doctor, family physician, and everyone's heard my story that I ended up with asthma that no one could fix. And I went to a homeopath and I got fixed in an hour. And, uh, and, there, and it was such an epiphany in my life that I always thought that God wanted me to be sick in order to experience the other side of it so I could be sitting here right now promoting what I'm promoting and, and, and being proud of being part of it. And in that regard, let's get to Anthony's question. I mean, he's asking the question that when we were talking about the nerve pathways and the acupuncture meridians as pathways. He's asking the question, are there any spiritual pathways that, that promote healing? Do some patients have this spiritual feeling and they heal better than others? I mean, have you ever gotten any insight into that? I've had patients that wanted to pray before we had, before I gave them their injections. And so I would always agree to prayer if they wanted it. I don't initiate it, but if they want to have prayer before injections, then I always join in, and that's that's part of the hmm. their particular healing, and and they seem to do better because they've had the prayer. They handle the injections better; it's easier for them, and they seem to respond. I I believe that people people who come in who are um, determined. Uh, to improve their lives, uh, determine that this treatment is going to help them, uh, they're positive about their lives, they're positive about their families, uh, they're positive about their place in the spiritual world. I think they do a lot better than, than grumpy people who hate everybody and uh, people who swear at me when I'm giving them their shots, I don't think they're as happy. I don't think they do as well as the people who are 
happy about it. Is there still Novocaine in your shots? Oh, sure. I so use lidocaine and marcaine. Lidocaine and marcaine yeah. plus the other ingredients. Right. So really, it doesn't hurt. Does, I mean, I, I've heard it say that it does, it does hurt a little bit. Well, the needle is a needle, and you've got to put the needle where the pain is before the medicine goes in to stop the pain. So putting the needle down is painful in some places. Other places, it's not very painful. And the different areas of the body are just more sensitive. In the medicine, when, it, when the medicine goes in, it spreads the tissues a little bit, so there's a little swelling sensation, and then an anesthetic starts to work, and then that usually goes away. But uh, some people respond more vigorously to that sensation. They say it hurts a lot more than others. And I had some people who practically go to sleep while I'm giving them the treatments. Really? Other people are telling me jokes while I'm giving them their treatments, uh, or I'm telling them jokes. I've, I've heard it said, no pain, no gain. Well, I don't really like that expression. You don't like that no, expression, okay. I just want no pain, and I want all gain. But I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to have pain necessary in order to have gain. I want to make it as painless as I possibly can to get the results. I just recently had a patient travel, this is someone you don't know that's never seen you, travel all the way to Calgary, Alberta to spend two weeks sleeping on a very high powerful mag. You know Dr. Bonley? Dr. Bonley and his magnets? Well, Dr. Bonley has created this theory of direct flow magnetism and the thing is as big as a MRI machine but it's not an alternating magnetism, it's a straight magnetism. And there are reports that they get the same effect from magnetism. Have you ever heard or seen anything? And it's very expensive, by the way, but have, have you ever seen anyone do this? Hear about it? No, but there are magnetic pieces of medical equipment that you can use to sit in or to put your leg in to help uh, tissues heal faster, to help fractures heal faster. Uh, How does that work? Do you have any idea? When you have an injury site, there's a negative charge at the site of the injury. And as long as that negative site uh, charge is there, those tissues are growing and they're stim being stimulated. Uh, once that becomes a positive or neutral charge, all the healing stops. And, and magnets direct the field, field of electrons and if they can help increase the electrons, for the, which is the negative field, in the injury site, then, then that should promote healing. Well, since you're actually, well, I'm just trying to think, since you're actually injecting something that's creating inflammation so that the healing would occur, you're probably making it highly negative. Right. So would it help to go home afterwards wearing a magnet? Maybe. I think magnets probably help. There, there's a piece of medical equipment called a magnetotron that a lot of doctors who do prolotherapy will just have the patient sit in the chair with this magnetotron around them, and they'll sit there for a half hour before they leave. Interesting. Well, you know, you've heard the story, uh, and, and this is an interesting story about classical homeopathy, is, the, is, is Dr. Hahnemann, who's the father of homeopathic medicine, wrote a book called The Organon, and, and the way the book is written is there's a 50-page introduction, and then there's chapters. Every, every point is made in like a numbered paragraph chapter. And, and he wrote the first book, it had the introduction and 50 paragraphs, and then when he learned more stuff three years later, he wrote edition two, but he didn't change anything, he just added another 30 of these paragraphs. And then three or four years later, he made edition three, and he added another 30 or 40 paragraphs. Well, at the time of his death, uh, he had, had written edition five, and there were like 190 of these paragraphs. Well, you've heard this story too, that when he was 80 years old, he married a 29-year-old woman who he healed, who traveled from Paris to Germany, and she took him back to Paris, and the father sent him up in practice. When he died, she took over his practice. And she lived another 38 or 40 years, and when she passed away, they found addition six with another 50 paragraphs under her bed that she evidently had been using and never told anybody. And in that, in that addition six, it says someday electricity will be useful in medicine, someday magnetism will be useful in medicine, and someday animal magnetism or 
or mesmerism or hypnotism will be useful in medicine. And this was written in 1842, way before there was electricity. I don't know what they had for electricity in those days. And this is actually part of homeopathy. And, and they, they have fought the acceptance of this extra addition, but they finally did accept it and came up with the conclusion that if it's not in these six editions, it isn't classical homeopathy. So theoretically, what you are doing is, is almost classical homeopathy, going all the way back to Hahnemann, who didn't probably own a needle. And, and, uh, and it's amazing that you are part of this right now, and, uh, and it's, it's a privilege to have you as part of our profession. What are your feelings on, on Arizona as a, as a home for a homeopathic profession that allows physicians such as yourself and me and all of our colleagues to be in practice independently without harassment from the government? Because in a lot of other states, they do get it. We're safe here. Well, in reality, the government has allowed us to do this in Arizona. Yes. And, and it's, I think it's the most fantastic state in the union because the patients have the opportunity of, of better selection, wider variety of choices, what they want to do with their health, with their health care. And doctors who want to practice more complete medicine have the opportunity of doing it under the homeopathic license. If we could only get insurance to pay for what we do, that's the one missing thing that we have. But, you know, you can't have all our blessings, but... Well, Insurance companies exist for the purpose of making money for insurance companies and stockholders. They don't exist for the purpose of taking care of people who pay their premiums. And, and as long as they're holding on to their money, they're going to find things to avoid paying for any excuse they can get to do it. Well, the thing is, though, they could actually save a lot of money and make people healthier. But they're not interested in saving money. It's um, the big I keep procedures. coming back. I'm sorry, I keep coming it's, back. This. It's the big procedures that cost $100,000 that they want to be able to pay for so they can raise your premium, so they can make more money, so they can give their CEO more money, and so their stockholders can make more money. If everybody cuts back, if we're able to save 90% of health care dollar by doing what you and I are doing across the country, well, those CEOs couldn't make 50 or 60 million dollars a year. So they make five or six million a year. I mean, you know, I mean, I, 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 the thing that doesn't make sense to me is that I absolutely know loads of people. Like I, I, I had a patient that I saw uh, just the other day that told me that she was in a car accident and she really hurt. And, and, and what could I do? I said, well, to be honest with you, I want to send you to Dr. Pomeroy. And, and she said, but I belong to this HMO. And he doesn't belong to my HMO. And, uh, and I said, but it's going to make you better quicker. He said, oh, i got to follow my insurance. And I said, well, that's a second-class form of medicine. And she says, well, I, I can't afford it. So the point is, is, is there's a problem in the fact that there's more and more people that would avail themselves of what we do and get better results. And, the, uh, and you know something? What I have a feeling, you know, we went to medical school not to make money. We went to medical school to learn how to heal people. I mean, that's, I mean, my interest was biology. I fell in love with biology when I was in high school, and I wanted to go to medical school so they would teach me how to fix things. And, yeah. I mean, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to become a people mechanic and, and, and care for people and, and get the good feelings and all that, and whatever rewards came, came. And I chose to be a family doctor, which is not the, the field that makes all the money in medicine. So, so the, the point is, is we want to help people. They didn't teach us all these things. I found them all out by accident. I personally had to get sick in order to experience the healing that then let me go and, and learn these other things. That's when I got really mad and went back to school to learn all the things that we have gone back to school to learn. And we're cheating people right now by, let, by not letting them get availed of this thing. I mean, I mean, how do we get the people out there to write letters to their congressmen and their representatives and say the insurance should pay for it. Don't answer that question. We've got three minutes to go. <laughs> just got the word. I would like to give you the last three minutes of just to explain your philosophy and wisdom of medicine and treating pain, because you see a lot of really sick people. What can we say to people to encourage them from, from your spiritual heart? 
the first thing we have to have is a patient who is determined to get well, determined to get over their pain problem and not be married to their insurance company. And then fortunately, some people don't have that option because they don't have enough income to make, the, make up the difference of going outside of their health insurance. But for the people that do, if they're determined to get well, they can get well. And what you and I do, it helps them get well. But that has to be the determination, probably the spiritual value <laughs> has to start. The spiritual value in that person's life has to be decided upon that they're going to get well no matter what. And then we can help the people a lot more. Uh, our job is to get people so they don't need us anymore. Absolutely. We, we want people who, are, who want to get well, who want to get away from doctors, who want to get away from these kind of problems, health problems, pain problems, so they can live a good life and help other people find their way. Well, that's the whole thing, taking care of yourself so you can take care of your family, live as long as you can, thank the guy upstairs or the gal upstairs, whichever, <laughs> whichever it might be, and, uh, and then go forward and, um, and, and just be better people. So with that, I, I would like to say that uh, the hour has gone by fast. This is Dr. Ken Pomeroy. What is your phone number so people can call you if they have pain and want to come see you? I'm at 602 912 Four nine nine six. If you want to find out more about prolotherapy, I have a website called www.drpomeroy.com. How many M's in Pomeroy? One. One M in Pomeroy. <laughs> and if you forgot this because you didn't write it down because you didn't have a pencil, there's a number that's going to come up in just a few seconds at the end of the show. You could call Anthony D'Antonio and he will pass you on so that you can uh, you can get the number from him. But one more time, your phone number. 602-912-4996. All right. Well, folks, it's been fun being here again this month. I'm Dr. Bruce Shelton. Uh, if you want to call me, call Anthony. He'll give you my number. And uh, uh, we're going to be back quicker. Instead of waiting a whole month, we have an extra show this month because of the show that's coming in Phoenix with Dr. Mickey Shima. We're going to get some more answers on acupuncture. So until next time, Thank you very much. Stay healthy, Dr. Pomeroy. Thank you for being here. It's been a pleasure. pleasure. Thank you.